and uh, the the this session the morning session i will be the chair and i am sadik rangwala from the raman research institute without further ado let me just introduce the first speaker which is who's swen heinemeyer from university of madrid and he will be talking about physics case for lepton colliders thanks a lot good morning everybody and sorry for the delay of this talk originally i was scheduled yesterday but British Airways didn't uh, like my travel plans. So they got slightly changed, but I'm happy that everything could be rescheduled and I'm here with you this morning. Yeah, this little cartoon shows already nearly everything that we have to know. We'll come back to this later. Now this doesn't work. <laughs> okay, now it works, very good. Physics case for lepton colliders, and in the program it said explicitly including mu plus mu minus colliders, and we'll see about that. So I'll give you first some introduction, talk about Higgs measurements of the Higgs at 125 GV. I'll talk about BSM Higgses and some other BSM physics that may be relevant. And of course, as requested by the organizers, some words on the muon collider as well. Let's get started. Uh, I start here from the European point of view, and this is the some words from the European Strategy for Particle Physics update, and there is a very clear recommendation. The next large facility after the high luminosity LHC for particle physics should be in a plus or minus collider. And if the European uh, Strategy for Particle Physics says this, there's hardly any doubt that this should really be the case. Why do they want this? To study the Higgs at 125 GV? to do top electroweak physics and to do BSM searches Higgs and non-Higgs related. Yeah. Of course, we all know the LHC is working, the high luminosity LHC will come and the new plus and minus collider will certainly come after or at best in the end phase of the high luminosity LHC. Yeah. So the physics potential of new lepton colliders, or I first concentrate on the plus minus colliders as said here, must be viewed in the context of the high lumi LHC expectations and therefore, they're often shown in comparison with each other. I think this makes a lot of sense. Now, <clears throat> this is just a short overview about all the possibilities. I know that there are many talks dedicated here to several of these. I just give you this as an overview where we are and what will be the focus here. Of course, we have the Large Hadron Collider. The high luminosity HC will come. It's approved. People are thinking about a high energy LHC in the same tunnel using new magnets. The question is, uh, will the magnets be ready or even possible? And then there are the various proposals for plus and minus colliders, the IRC possibly in Japan. Uh, sometimes I wrote here 2019, 2020, 2021. I just put an X here because of the delay. Uh, they will start, this would start at 250 GV, would go up to 1000 GV. There's the compact linear collider, uh, which would be at CERN starting at 380 GV, going up to 3000 GV, the highest for C plus or minus energy of all the proposals. Then come the circular machines, FCC EE, also at CERN, where the feasibility study is uh, on the way. And here the collisions would go up to 350 GV. The CPC, the circular plus or minus collider to be built in China, uh, three, 250 G, maybe also going up to 350 G. I think the official proposal still talks about 250 GV. And the new kit on the block here is the uh, C cube, the cool copper collider, which was discussed recently in the snow mass activities, for example, which could be constructed at Fermilab. If I got it right, they would go up to 600 GV and even a 2 TV uh, uh, option is discussed. Going back to Hadron colliders in the very far future, there may be the FCC HH going up to 1000 TV. This possible is the same as here because it relies on the same type of magnets. And then, of course, there's also the mu plus and minus colliders, which will be covered in the last part of my talk. So I will be focusing mostly of these here. Often I'll draw results from ILC or FCCE, which are abundantly available in the literature, whereas, uh, for example, C cubed has only very preliminary results so far. Now, we all know that uh, there was a discovery in 2012. You all know these plots. And we also know that the discovery that we have is a very standard model-like discovery. Everything, all the measurements are in agreement with the standard model. On the other hand, uh, we also know 
that the standard model cannot be our ultimate theory. Yeah, gravity is not their hierarchy problem, no unification of the forces. Dark matter is not included, the barrenness symmetry of the universe cannot be explained. Neutrino mass are not included. And there are some experimental data which are not in agreement with the standard model prediction. And I'll come back to, for example, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which is just an example of this kind of uh, anomalies that are around nowadays. Combining the two facts, there's only one possible conclusion, and this will be the base of uh, large parts of my talk. The standard model of the Higgs that has been discovered cannot be the standard model Higgs boson, yeah? because we know the standard model can't be the ultimate theory, can't be the standard model Higgs boson. However, this is not the real question I want to ask. The real question is, does the BSM physics that necessarily exists has any relevant impact on the Higgs? Are there maybe any hints from LHC results at least as guidance or as toy examples in order to uh, do some interpretation of this work or to have an idea how future directions might be going. Not necessarily take them as true, but just as an inspiration of what can be, uh, what can be analyzed right now. And if so, uh, so if there's any BSM physics relevant, which model might this be? Now, in order to answer this, there are three possible uh, obvious ways to answer it, we have to check for the changed properties of this, what I now often call H125, not to call it standard model Higgs. Of course, we also have to check for additional Higgs bosons above, but also below 125 GeV, and necessarily check for other BSM physics related to the standard model problems. Yeah, this will be the way how to go ahead. The main questions that uh, we have and that a future plus or minus collider can contribute to. What are the couplings of this particle? Are the couplings proportional uh, to the mass of the particle as required by the brout angler higgs mechanism? What are the mass total width spin and CP properties uh, of this particle? Is there a CP violation? What are the self-couplings? Can we reconstruct this, uh, the Higgs potential? Is this particle a single fundamental scalar as predicted by the stellar model or maybe has it a larger structure? Is it part of a model with additional scalar singlets, doublets, or <laughs> dot, dot, dot should be here. <laughs> Little slash is missing. <laughs> or could it be a composite state yeah, bound by new interactions? Does this particle couple to new particles with no other couplings to the stellar model, these so-called Higgs portal models? Is the particle mixed with any new scale of exotic origin, radiance, extra dimension models, etc.? Yeah? This is a plethora of questions that are related to the fact that the Higgs can't be the standard model Higgs and that we need BSM physics for the reasons that I've talked to you about. And this will be key for the analysis of the potential of the plus and minus colliders. Now, let's start with the Higgs at 125 GV. And uh, I have here a plot that shows as a center of the function of mass energy, the production cross section. Uh, the uh, red line, the largest one here, is the uh, Higgs Strahlung process indicated by this diagram at the tree level. And then a blue rising is the weak boson fusion. And the green slightly rising is the weak boson fusion with the Z bosons here, and then the total cross section. And one can observe that the uh, total cross section, but in particular the ZH cross section, has a peak at 240, 250 GV. If you remember, when I discuss the various options of the plus and minus colliders, they're all more or less supposed to start at 250 GV, except maybe click that would start somewhat higher. But having them at 250 GV, the energy that can most easily be reached in this kind of setup is perfect to have a Higgs factory via this production mechanism, but also having then at slightly higher energies, the weak boson fusion kicking in, which can be relevant for some measurements. It's well known, we have this uh, very nice measurement of the, the model independent measurement of the cross section via this recall method, where we just observe the recall peak, which also gives us in, uh, well, which is crucial for a model independent coupling measurement, something that the LHC or any proton proton machine would not give us. And on top of it, it also provides, already this measurement provides the measurement of the mass better than 50 MeV. Now, uh, which mass measurement do we want? This is always the question, what can we measure and what do we want and do we need this kind of collider? If one looks at the mass alone, first of all, the Higgs mass is a fundamental parameter and uh, deserves a high precision measurement on its own right, but from a 
uh, physics precision point of view, the Higgs mass is an input parameter for Higgs physics. And for example, the uncertainty uh, where we, well, we are now maybe a little bit better than uh, 200 MeV, uh, this induces an uncertainty in the branching ratios uh, for the Z bosons or the W bosons at the level of two to two and a half percent. We want to measure this at the percent level at, at, at least, and therefore, a strong improvement here would be desirable just as for this one very one physics example that I've shown to you here. This is an overview about the various collider options for the uh, precision measurements for the Higgs boson couplings. Uh, maybe a bit busy, but I'll throw, slowly walk you through if you don't remember this plot. Um, these uh, kappas are the coupling strength modifiers in a simplified uh, framework of the Higgs boson to the standard model particle. So kappa W is the coupling uh, relative to the standard model of the Higgs to WW. Then this uh, gray bar is always the expectation of the high Lumi LHC. And here you can see there is some theory assumption in there in order to make this uh, plot possible. So at a, at a PP collider, you can't do it without any uh, additional theoretical input. So gray is the bar that we will get anyway. Yeah, And well, the, these numbers will change from, from plot to plot, but the gray bar is nearly always the basis filling it up. Yeah? And then one can see the, um, for example, the ILC measurements would be the green ones going from the light one, the 250 GV, then going up to higher center of mass energy, the darker ones. Uh, similarly for uh, click, the light one, and then going to higher energies, the darker ones, CPC is only one bar and FCC starts, FCC E at 240, then adding measurements at uh, 365. And then the last one, the best one, combining with FCC HH. And one can see, that the plus and minus collider very roughly have similar results. Yeah, I don't think there's a really fundamental uh, difference in, in their precisions. Of course, the FCC HHHEE appears better, but it also includes then the very far future measurements of a proton-proton uh, collider at 100 TV. And also there are different theory assumptions included for this kind of measurements. Also, one always should remember the time scale. If you say, ah, we want FCC, we want this uh, dark blue bar, very good. I'm also in favor of it, but we will all be dead when this measurement will be there. Yeah, so we have to keep this in mind. What are the required precisions um, in order to get to BSM physics? I give you just two examples, one Susie example, one composite Higgs example. Couplings to gauge bosons will deviate from one at in the sub percent level, depending on the new uh, energy. And also for composite Higgs, depending on this composite scale, this will be in the percent range. Couplings to fermions uh, can, in this kind of the 2x doublet model uh, type 2 example, uh, can differ by several percent, but that are then suppressed strongly again with this new uh, physics scale and also by this parameter 10 beta that we will come back to in a moment, whereas couplings to bottom quarks and tau leptons, they usually show the largest deviation. They don't have this additional uh, suppression factor here. And similarly for composite Higgs, couplings to fermions are expected uh, in the percent range. So take home message, couplings to bosons are needed probably in the per mil range, couplings to fermions in the percent range, and only plus and minus colliders can yield this precision. I think I'll skip this for sake of time and um, ask the question, what can we learn? By the way, this is of course a very famous BSM Higgs sector represented here. So let's assume that we do see deviation in these measurements. What can we learn from that? And this is the so-called Higgs inverse problem. And people were very worried or maybe are very worried that we will not be able to disentangle it once we see deviation, which model can be behind. There's a very one simple solution to the Higgs inverse problem. I can assure you, once a deviation in the Higgs coupling is established experimentally, the next day on the archive, there will be all the theory models explaining this in all the glory detail. Yeah, so this we will have. But let's try to take a look at this already now. And uh, I give you just a summary of this. And I have a lot of what we call Vesha line plots in the backup where we can disentangle the various models from each other. But I have here only one summary for that. Uh, this is taken from uh, the ILC 250, where they compared one parameter point for various models that you can see here, like, uh, well, of course, standard model, uh, 
the MSSM, various other uh, two X doublet models, composite Higgs, um, little Higgs models, radion and Higgs singlet extension. And you not only want to disentangle the standard model like Higgs from a BSM Higgs, you also want to disentangle the various BSM results from each other. And they assumed here, as I said, 250 GV center of mass energy to inverse autobahn. And well, they did this EFT analysis. And the numbers tell you how many sigmas each model is can be distinguished from the other. So this one from this one, eight sigma or so. Green is good, orange is not so good, red is bad. Meaning, well, we can do quite well already at 250 G with this uh, uh, assumed luminosity, but you can do even better if one adds the measurements that are foreseen at 350 with a low luminosity, this is for the TT uh, threshold, plus the measurements at 500 GV, then you can see nearly everything is green. Uh, if it's orange, you are very close to five sigma, and th this one combination is the only one that stays at 3.6. So this shows in general that in a plus or minus machine with sufficient luminosity can disentangle not only BSM Higgs sectors from the standard model, but also BSM Higgs sectors from each other. Of course, this analysis was done for a specific model point. You can play around. But in principle, this shows the uh, possibilities that such a collider offers us. So I think there's a very good, it's a very good reason for such a machine. Another example to highlight what the in the plus and minus machine can do with respect to the high luminosity LHC. This is one concrete example where we assumed a certain supersymmetric uh, scenario. I will not go into details. We fixed all the parameters and assumed that uh, the mass of the new Higgs bosons is at 1 TeV and 10 beta, the ratio of the two vacuum expectation values is located at 3. So the star is the model point assumed. And then we looked at the Higgs precision measurements that the various colliders could do and how this constrains this parameter space. The light pink area is the one where only high luminosity LHC projections are taken into account. And uh, you can see. Well, in 10 beta, you, you get some range, but for the new physics scale, I can tell you this doesn't close. Yeah, this continues here. However, if you go to a plus and minus machine, and again, we took here the ILC 250 and 500 measurements as an example, but this holds for other plus and minus colliders equally, you get an upper limit on the new physics scale. Yeah, here at the case of about 2 TeV. This means E plus or minus machines can set upper limits on BSM Higgs scales, and this can set a clear target for other future collider searches. Yeah, this can likely not be done, uh, can easily escape the high luminosity LC, where as at in the plus or minus machine, this likely can be done that you can set this kind of upper limit here. The holy grail, as it's often called in particle physics, the Higgs boson self coupling. I just for now, I give you just one uh, overview plot here. We want to measure the trilinear Higgs coupling. And the color coding nicely is exactly the same as in the kappa plot that I've shown to you before. The uh, circular machines like CPC and FCCE have the problem that they can't go to the Higgs production. Uh, they go up to 350, maybe 360, 65 GV. But for the Higgs production, you need more than 500 GV. So here, only some indirect uh, EFT determination can be done, and then you are stuck at the level of about 50%. These are these uh, light shaded bars. The darker bars, they include direct uh, dihex production. And again, you can see that you end up depending on the center of mass energy at a precision of 20 or something like 10%. Yeah, here, for example, click at high energies can go up to 10%. One word of caution, and I'll come back to this later. These extrapolations, they always assume that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling has the value as predicted in the standard model. However, this value has certain drawbacks, as I will show to you later, and this uh, can have severe consequences for the precision with which a future collider can determine the trilinear Higgs coupling. So here always kappa lambda is the true value of the Higgs coupling divided by the standard model prediction. Yeah? And here all these uh, determinations assume that this kappa lambda is equal to one. Now, there's one extrapolation, uh, which we did, or uh, which was done here by, by Jenny List from Hamburg. Uh, she went from minus 0.5 to about 2 in this uh, kappa lambda, yeah, the true value divided by the standard model value. The dark lines show you what can be expected at the high luminosity LHC. Yeah, this was this, uh, fifth, well, this is the 50% measurement that can be expected at the high luminosity LHC. 
And you can see that it becomes a bit better if we go to smaller values. This is because of the interference of signal and background, which uh, increases the cross-section once uh, this coupling becomes smaller for the high luminosity LHC. But for larger values, this becomes worse. On the other hand, the, here are the numbers for the ILC 500 in green, which are better here, become very good here, but here become very bad. Now here, the interference works in the other way because there are different diagrams contributing and the determination deteriorates completely. However, adding the one TV data with the new new Higgs Higgs uh, final state goes on the other way, again, a different interference pattern and the ILC can maintain its high precision and here also become very, very precise in this for, very, for the larger values. Now, um, I told you one important failure of the standard model is the barrenness symmetry of the universe. And what you need, or one very possible, one, one popular mechanism, let's say, is uh, having a first order phase transition in the early universe when the, uh, when the universe goes to its true vacuum state. And um, this can happen, and I give you just one example here. Uh, so you get a first order like phase transition for the barrenness a symmetry of the universe, which can also give you gravitational waves that can be detected by uh, LISA, for example, or possibly by some um, atomic interferometers. And the last talk today, I think, will touch upon this, Oliver, right? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, what you find when you look in this kind of examples, that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling doesn't have the standard model value. With the standard model, it doesn't work. You don't get a first order phase transition. You don't get the barrenness symmetry, which was one of the failures. And usually what you find is that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling is more at the range of two rather than one. Now, if you remember this plot here, you see the LHC becomes worse, E plus and minus becomes better. And this is reflected here. I show you, well, this is the signal over noise ratio expected at LISA. This is the kappa lambda value. And the color coding tells you the precision that can be acquired at the high luminosity LHC. You can see here you're only in the 70, 72% range, so very bad determination. Whereas the determination at the ILC 500 only is now at the 10% range. Before it was 20, but at the value that may be favored by Byron assumption of the universe, you get a 10% determination. Again, the this shows how superior I plus minus colliders with respect to the high luminosity LHC. You can also look at exotic Higgs decays. I'll not go into details here. Of course, new physics would imply changes in exotic Higgs decays. There's a plethora of uh, final states. Again, the color coding as before, uh, the various E plus and minus colliders, gray is high luminosity LHC. Again, strong improvement. I'll not go into details what this may imply for one or the other model, but also here, of course, the plus and minus can be much better than uh, PP. Another important point, the Higgs consistency test via electric precision observables. What is the general idea? Well, one takes precisely measured data, double boson mass, effective weak mixing angle, et cetera. And you compare this with your favorite theory prediction, which can be standard model, SUSY, or whatever model you like here. And then via these virtual contributions to this standard model process, via these virtual contributions, you can get access to unknown mass scales. This was the way the Higgs boson mass was predicted within the framework of the standard model before its discovery. But you can also predict the BSM mass scales this way. Of course, you need very high accuracy in the measurement as well as in the theory prediction. And there are only very few models that may be ready in order to play this game, which is, of course, the standard model, which is also the MSSM and probably pure multi Higgs models, because that's particularly simple to do this kind of calculation. The last time this was done for electric precision data in order to confront the standard model with uh, the direct measurement. With the indirect measurement, this is already a couple of years old from the GFITTER group, and I can see this was all the data taken into account, gives you an indirect precision of 90 plus minus roughly 20 GV in agreement in quotation marks at the 1.8 sigma level. Although there was a slight rise in tension over the years, uh, of course, not taken into account is the recent measurement of the W over mass by CDF, which I will not discuss here. This would be a talk on its own right which would increase this tension to something like seven sigma. Now, 
all this precision data will improve with the plus and minus machines. Either uh, here I took the numbers ILC Giga Z, much more, much better, of course, if one goes to FCCE with the Terra Z option, because just many more Z bosons are produced. I only give here the values for the effective free X angle or the W boson mass, and of course the top quark mass, which is determined from a top threshold scan. A strong improvement can be seen. These numbers do not include theory uncertainties. I will not discuss them here. But well, the evaluation that you can do for this, well, we had here this uh, parabola with the current data. And you can ask the question, how will this parabola improve with future data? And the only evaluation that has been done use these numbers. You can imagine using these numbers, the parabolas will become even steeper. But using only this kind of numbers, this was done by two groups. Uh, you get this uh, plot here. This is the old parabola, and this would be the new parabola. Yeah, this is the GFITA group. This was the electro lab electric working group when this was done. Yeah, this is this famous blue band that you all know, and then this is the future. And you get an indirect determination at the level of 6 GV or better. And this will be an extremely sensitive test of the standard model and, of course, also of VSM extensions of it. Yeah, And you can see that even if the current, well, this was here, the current value was 94 GV when this was done. but it would be incompatible at the five sigma level with 125 GV measurement of the Higgs boson. And again, this does not take into account the recent W boson mass measurement of CDF. So again, the plus and minus gives you also for the precision data a strong improvement that can be important in the future. BSM Higgses. Well, we, I was talking a little bit about uh, the sensitivity of the, about the indirect sensitivity to BSM Higgses, but now let's see what the plus minus colliders can do in the direct searches for BSM Higgs bosons. There are many, many models around, singlet editions, doublet models and all its types, SUSE models, uh, SUSE models with singlets, you can add triplets. And as I was saying before, you can also have BSM models without extended Higgs sectors where you can look for these change properties, but this was covered in the previous part of my talk. Yeah? But there's a plethora of models that uh, naturally give you BSM Higgs bosons. And uh, I'll start with the BSM Higgs bosons above 125 GV. And again, one has to take into account what the high luminosity LHC can give us. This is the plane of the new Higgs boson mass scale, MA versus, again, this factor of 10 beta. This is an old limit now. We are somewhat better. But the blue and the red lines show the projections in this plane, what the high luminosity LHC will be capable of doing. And they can exclude all this parameter space here up above this, uh, these lines. Now, how does it look at the plus and minus? There are two ways to produce heavy Higgs bosons looking at this Higgs Strahlung process. You can either <coughs> produce a heavy Higgs again with the Z boson. And this is a 2 x doublet model uh, type uh, situation. It's concretely the MSM, but in the 2 x doublet model, it looks exactly the same where one has uh, suppression factors with respect to the standard model, either the sine squared beta minus alpha or cosine squared beta minus alpha, where the heavy Higgs always goes with the cosine squared. You can also produce two Higgs bosons together, uh, a CP odd one and a CP even one. Uh, and in this case, it goes with the sine squared. Now, the measurements of the Higgs properties tell us that the sine squared is probably close to one, and then the cosine necessarily is close to zero meaning you can produce the heavy Higgs bosons not singly, but only in pairs. This is a very common feature on all this kind of models. You can't produce one heavy state, but only two heavy states. And by looking at some other restrictions, this tells you that very roughly the reach of an plus or minus collider is about half the cent of mass energy. Yeah, you can only pair produce them and the masses are similar. Very simple. This is one evaluation of click where they analyzed how far they can go in this new mass scale, assuming, for example, here 3 TV, you would expect 1.5 TV and they go up to 1.4. So nearly the kinematic limit, exactly as I was telling you before. Very nice. Translating this into the previous plot in very simple terms, even if you go to the ILC 1000, mm, this will not tell you very much about the heavy Higgs bosons here, of course. Yeah, You have to go to substantially higher energies if you can go to this kind of energy, a lot of parameter space can be covered. This may look small, but uh, well, I think it's a substantial and important part of this uncovered parameter space. So there are some unique opportunities if you're able to go to high energies. There's one more example. You can even go beyond this limit by having this kind of production here. 
depending on what you assume for this uh, sine beta minus alpha. This shows you the, uh, well, this looks at the decay of the new Higgs boson to two gauge bosons. This is the invariant mass spectrum of this decay. And if the, well, here it was assumed the set of mass energy one TV and the Higgs mass four energy V is here clear peak, but you're still below the threshold. This assumes a mass of 600 GB, and you can still see a peak here. Yeah? And I'm sure if this kind of situation was realized, much more analysis or much more uh, person power would go into it, and one could try to work out this peak even above this half percent of mass energy threshold. Just to show an example, five minutes. OK, this means I was talking too much to you. Good, thanks. Let's see where we can get. Let's come to one of my favorite topics, the Higgs bosons below 125 GV. And in this plot, one can see the mass scale versus the effective coupling to Z bosons squared. This is what was excluded by LEP. And again, the plus and minus, depending on the setup, can cover either this parameter space above the orange or uh, above the red line. So large part of this parameter space for a very reduced coupling, which would be something like this uh, um, cosine squared beta minus alpha or so, can be covered by any plus the minus machine. Now let's take one. Well, I come to this in a moment. How could one see such Higgs boson? For example, again via this uh, uh, recoil with a Z boson, uh, where the Higgs can decay to anything, uh, and the green is the background. This is the Z. This is the standard model, uh, the 125 G Higgs boson. This recoil, but depending on the energy that you assume for your new Higgs boson, you can see a very nice recoil peak. Yeah, so again, such Higgs boson, ideal for any plus and minus machine that is on the market right now. My favorite example is always uh, based on some experimental data where there was an axis seen by CMS in the search here, PP goes to Higgs to photon photon at 95 GeV. Uh, I don't think I have time to walk you through, but they have a three sigma axis here, which is uh, not uh, excluded, not even touched by the ATLAS measurements. And we are waiting for new, new data there. So this is the channel at the PP collider. And uh, if you remember LEP, there was also an excess at the same mass in the BB final state. Yeah? So there are three, there are two different final states that uh, tell that there might be a Higgs in, in this mass range here, either at the two or the three sigma level. And if one wants to investigate this, we try to do this. We took the two X tablet model, added another Higgs singlet, and uh, analyze whether first, can this uh, explain the axis? B, what can a plus and minus machine do in this case? Yeah, so this is a very nice toy example for a light exposon and we analyzed uh, what kind of measurements can be done. And what we see here, well, here, this is the signal strength measured at CMS. This is signal strength, strength measured at lab. All the colored points are prediction by our model. This is the one sigma ellipse and you can see uh, this model can easily explain the two axes. So this works either in the 2 x model type 2 or 2 x model type 4. Uh, and this would be the one that is predicted by supersymmetry, for example. Now, this works, so this kind of model can do it. Um, can we produce the new Higgs boson at any plus and minus machine? This is, again, the lab exclusion limit. This was the expected one. This was the axis that lab has seen. And these parameter points are predicted by the model. This is the line above. We can see everything. So really, we can produce this Higgs boson easily and probably study it in detail. We can do two types of coupling measurements. We can study the couplings of the 125. Here, the coupling to tau plus tau minus versus uh, ZZ, standard model prediction high luminosity LHC measurements, uh, ILC 250 measurements, but any plus and minus collider could do this uh, green ellipse here. These are the two parameter spaces, Twix double model type two, Twix double model type four. You can see there's a large deviation, meaning with the uh, E plus and minus precision, you can either exclude this model or if this green ellipse, which is now centered at the standard model point, would be centered at one of these points, would this clearly exclude the standard model and possibly tell you, depending where you are, which of the two types is favored. But you can do more. As I told you, you can produce the new Higgs boson and then do a coupling determination of the new Higgs boson. And we did also this exercise. Uh, again, coupling of the light Higgs boson to tau plus tau minus versus coupling to uh, ZZ. 
type 2, type 4, clearly distinguished. Furthermore, you can see these little green ellipses. These would be the precisions that one can expect for the coupling determination. This would really help you to pin down where you are in the parameter space, yeah, via measurement of this new Higgs boson at E plus E minus. Good. I don't have much time, I know. Uh, I wanted to say a few words on BSM physics. I will probably skip most of it, but will make you aware of a few facts and uh, tell you what E plus E minus can do. Uh, of course, indirect evidence is nice. Maybe even light Higgs bosons can be seen, but can we really see other new particles? Yeah, and at, e plus, at PP colliders, we have higher energy, higher reach for colored particles, but there are uh, difficult regions like compressed spectra. E plus E minus, on the other hand, lower energies, easier reach for uncolored particles, and difficult regions can be covered much easier, but potentially or particularly compressed spectra. Yeah? And then there's a the question, do we have maybe hints for the mass scales that we can expect here? Just to show you, compressed spectra, is this something, yes, is this something very special or not? Two different analyses, uh, one in SUSY, but, uh, with low mu and the global fit, tells you compressed spectra are something very normal. Now I can tell you, since I don't have time, compressed spectra for the light SUSY particles are particularly difficult for the LHC. Yeah, it has problems to see compressed spectra, whereas for a plus and minus, this can be done very easily. And I'll skip this and come to one final plot. This one here. Yeah. Here we did an analysis taking into account measurements from G minus two, dark matter measurements, etc., for various SUSY scenarios where we can have compressed spectra. This is the mass of the second lightest particle, and this is the mass gap. Um, these lines here show you the reach of the Hailumi LHC for various analyses, whereas the vertical lines tell you how far any plus and minus collider can go. And for the three scenarios that are given here, you can see they could all escape high luminosity LHC measurements, whereas they can be covered at least, well, with this latest, but also here, this is the ILC 1000. Practically everything can be covered. All small mass gaps uh, should be coverable. And there's much more on this in the backup. So again, a clear superior possibility for a plus and minus machines. With this, I skip the cross sections and uh, come to my conclusions. Ah, sorry, I forgot. Some words on the muon collider. I, I uh, well, Forgive me. Uh, I took here some sentences from the Muon Collider Forum report. Muon Colliders being circular and compact provide a unique combination of energy precision and high luminosity. Thus, they are a distinctively attractive option. This has two key advantages which are normally competing in usual electron and proton-based colliders. Equivalent high energy collisions reached in a compact setting and a cleaner non-QCD dominated environment to undertake precision, uh, physics studies in it. And my take, this is all correct, and I would love to have any plus, a mu plus or minus collider. From a physics and maturity point of view, I think uh, mu plus or minus collider should come after the E plus or minus collider. And if you really want to hear about my favorite one, which is the NLSP collider, you have to ask me over coffee. But of course, mu plus or minus, there are examples where they can do very well. This is Higgs precision measurements. This is um, the measurements of the trilinear coupling, uh, which can be good and better at FC, the, better than FCCHH, and also reach for new physics because high energies can be reached. Yeah, you can see here new physics, depending on the scenario in the multi-TV range can be covered. Yeah, And so muon colliders are great, and I would love to have them, but for me, they are the next step after A plus E minus. And with this, I conclude. These are my conclusions, very short. Uh, so. Let's build a new plus and minus collider and, of course, the new collider afterwards. Thanks a lot. We are open for questions. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Thanks for a nice talk. You uh, talked elaborately on the Higgs uh, couplings details and things like that. Um, what about the other couplings, like, for example, the gauge couplings and then the top quark, for example? 
uh, of course, 250 may be difficult, but higher energy. Yes, you are uh, absolutely right. I skipped this because well, I couldn't uh, put more into it. You're absolutely right. Also, these couplings, of course, can be determined with a much better precision at the plus or minus collider. Here, if I remember correctly, also higher energies are advantageous for the couplings to top quarks. Yeah, you can measure them already at the threshold, but much better once you go to 450, 500 GV center of mass energy. And then they can determine very, very precisely. And if people are doing now these global fits in an EFT framework, they're including all this into the fit. And one can see how also from this side, the fit improves substantially by including the plus and minus precision. Yeah, this is a very important ingredient. I fully agree. From this point of view, I only covered the measurements for the electric precision observables, but you're absolutely right. Couplings to gauge bosons and particularly top quarks and bottom quarks are a crucial ingredient and they are much better at the plus and minus machines. Yeah. And how about the dark matter? Searches. Dark matter searches always depending on the scenario. I I think there it's it's a bit too vague. You have to really go into the scenario. We did this evaluation only for the MSSM. And uh, well, maybe I can go back a few slides here. Um uh, yeah, in this kind of scenarios, you can also look. For the production, uh, I think this is, sorry, this is in the backup. We looked at the production of dark matter particles. Um, uh, I, I will not get there. Uh, we looked, because this is very slow, at the production of dark matter particles. And this can be done very nicely at the plus and minus machines. But this is going so slow that I will not get there. No, sorry. Yeah, Take please. a look at the talk. And uh, there, are, there are many examples. How? Also, the dark matter particles can be produced, and the well, this is not in the backup, but also the the couplings can be measured. And the question is whether you can then reconstruct the dark matter density. And also, there it was shown that with the plus and minus precision, this may be possible, whereas with PP precision, this may not be possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's a question there. Ah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So yeah, I was just curious that the, for heavy Higgs searches, now mm -hmm. in the lepton collider, the coupling will be mainly rely on the electroweak coupling. Yeah. But if let's say the model choose to be in the alignment limit, then the product producing heavy Higgs will be difficult because we don't <laughs> have any other thing, right? Well, then you have to produce them in pairs. Yeah, yeah. The pair production is, of course, a possibility. Yeah. Then you are limited by the subcenter of mass energy. But this was exactly the point. Yeah, And the alignment limit gives you a large pair production cross-section, but single production goes to zero. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And another correct. thing is, like, am I curious? So why ILC can put a upper bound on the new physics, but HLLC cannot? Can you this little? Uh, well, <laughs> let me see whether I'm, I'm sorry that this is so slow. I have one plot on this. Yeah, in the beginning, actually. No, I, the real plot is in the backup. It's something like this one here. Yeah, this was the scenario that I was showing to you uh, for MA1000, 10 beta 3. Uh, let's say, let's take the, this one here. This is the one that I was showing. Okay, doesn't matter. It's more or less what I wanted to show you. Um, the high luminosity LHC precision is shown as red bar, and then the e plus and minus in green or blue bars. The orange horizontal bar is the theory prediction. And you can see that the high luminous LHC uh, precision is just not good enough. Yeah, you can't say anything anymore. And then this improved precision at the plus and minus is good enough to set this upper limit. This is an indirect fit. Yeah. If the mass scale was smaller, 700 GV, then also high luminosity LHC could still do it. So it all depends where the heavy Higgs boson mass scale is located. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm sorry, we have to take the questions over coffee because uh, we have a speaker waiting online. The next speaker is waiting online. My apologies sorry. Uh, for this. Um, so uh, with that, let's thank uh, Sven. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Benjamin Nakhon from Berkeley, and he is talking about machine learning in the HEP. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Oh, 
Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay. Very good. I'll get started. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And I'm really sorry I can't be there with you all um, today. So I'll talk about um, machine learning and I'll give um, a broad overview. Um, now, uh, I want to start by sort of setting the scene for uh, how I uh, view what we do in high energy physics. And sort of there's these two parallel paths there's the theory path on the left, the experimental path on the right. The ultimate goal, of course, is to first infer something about nature. And in order to do so, determine sort of our theory of everything. Um, on the left hand side, we have a forward model. As I say, we can simulate nature given by some Lagrangian. And then we can um, build experiments to make observations comparing the two and hopefully do some inference. Uh, machine learning is playing uh, a role, in some cases, a critical role in nearly all aspects of this um, pipeline, both on the theory side and on the experimental side, um, all the way from experimental design to control. Um, to data processing offline, and then on the theory side for accelerating slow simulations and doing inference. Okay, now I don't have time uh, in the allocation I've been given to go over every aspect of machine learning for high energy physics um, across the various um, domains um, that our field is composed of. So instead, I thought I would pick three topics and try to cover them in a little bit more detail to give you a sense of the, of the breadth. And then I'm very happy to say more um, later. OK, um, so I'm going to start um, with this um, bottom right hand part here, which says data curation, which is sort of a catch all word for many things. Um, and uh, 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 data curation can include all aspects of reconstruction from calibration, clustering, noise mitigation, particle identification, et cetera, et cetera. This is to a large extent where most of machine learning has been applied um, so far. Um, and the very first task that we have to do is understand how to represent our data. Um, high energy physics data are very complex, and there are many different ways that we could represent them. Um, for instance, we could imagine representing our data from a number, taking a number of um, four vectors or fixed features, and then applying some uh, network, neural network or other machine learning um, algorithm appropriate for a fixed set of, of inputs. Um, but if we represent instead our data as variable sets or images or sequences or trees or graphs, then for each uh, representation, there's a corresponding natural um, machine learning architecture or architectures that can be applied. So let me walk you through a little bit about how that goes. First, let me talk with, uh, start with images, um, which to a large extent has driven the deep learning revolution in industry um, and uh, correspondingly has made an impact on energy physics. Uh, so uh, some of our experiments, the data are naturally represented as images. Some of them require some, some tweaking. So let's say you have a collider, um, you know, um, image uh, the collider event like the one shown here um, you can imagine um, projecting the energy out of the surface of a cylinder um, and then thinking about the um, energy deposited in a given um, location as sort of the pixel intensity of a grayscale image um, and if you have multiple detector elements say like different calorimeters or say a tracker and a calorimeter or different other or other modalities then you can imagine having say like a color image where you have like say red, green, and blue images where the pixel intensity um, is say the energy deposited in a given um, detector component. Um, so you can imagine having some kind of global uh, event information and then you can also imagine regions of interest like jets or other um, localized features depending on the um, experiment. Um, and then um, you can imagine taking processing those images using say state-of-the-art deep neural networks for instance using convolutional neural networks. And there are some complexities we have to keep in mind. For instance, our data, like I said, are complex. So they, that includes uh, the fact that they often represent uh, our respect of various symmetries. In this case, there's a clear symmetry, rotational symmetry. Um, and so these are images. I've shown them here as you know, two-dimensional unrolled um, squares. But in practice, of course, the left-hand side and the right-hand side or the bottom and the top, however you like to look at it, are, are actually the same. And it's something we have to tell um, the machine learning algorithm about. Um, but in any case, one could train um, uh, approaches to be able to distinguish, let's say, different kinds of events from each other. Okay, so that's that's images. Um, now, uh, images, of course, are very natural in many cases, but in some cases, they are not the most natural. And one key challenge with images is that they have a fixed set of, of inputs. Uh, in many contexts, this is good because the data have that structure. Um, however, it's not always the case. So for instance, like imagine you have an event with a variable number of alkaline particles. 
And if there's a variable number, then it's not necessarily um, well matched to an image. So I'm going to represent instead these particles as a sequence in order to apply variable length approaches that have been um, pioneered in natural language processing um, to have access to the full feature granularity. Um, so one example of how this has been done um, already is in the context of uh, what are called recurrent neural networks. Um, so it's like a convolutional neural network. A convolutional neural network applies across uh, an image, and a recurrent neural network ap applies a, um, a module across sequence. Um, and you would imagine ordering, say, all the particles inside some hydronic jet to do flavor tagging. And um, you can see here how this would work. Let's see, you have a bunch of charged particle trajectories inside this jet. And then this um, RNN basically applies um, to each track one at a time, taking as input the previous output, um, and then processing one track at a time. And so in this way, it can, it can process at variable length um, arbitrarily long sequences. OK. Um, there are also hybrids between convolutional networks and recurrent neural networks. So here's a relatively sophisticated neural network architecture used by the CMS experiment um, that processes um, all the particles um, for flavor tagging, where you can process the individual um, charged particles, neutral particles, vertex information. And there's first some dimensionality reduction done with the convolutional neural network. And then because there's a variable number of inputs, you can imagine doing a recurrent neural network on top of that. OK, and the gains are, are really significant over classical methods. OK, um, next I will talk about variable sets. So a challenge with sequence learning is that um, thanks to quantum mechanics, often uh, our particles or other objects come to us with no unique order. So I could, order, I could always impose an order like energy ordered, um, but that's um, not, not unique. Um, so a common scenario is that we have a variable length set. Um, so set in the sense that the, I can permute the, the, um, the constituents. And so here you can imagine using set learning. And there are a number of strategies, one of which is called deep sets. And the idea is to factorize the problem into two neural networks, one that embeds your um, set elements into some latent space, an abstract vector space, and then another uh, operation that acts on the sum of the latent space vectors. And sums are permutation invariant that can naturally accommodate variable length. And so in this way, you can construct um, what's probably universal for variable length set learning. Um, and uh, that's sort of shown, shown schematically here and um, here um, pictorially. So imagine you have a bunch of particles. Each of those particles has some features, so like the four vector and additional information. There's this final network that embeds them into some abstract space. You can sum all the abstract latent vectors. Then you have another um, neural network that processes the sum. Um, and here is a picture that shows um, as a function of the abstract um, latent vector space dimension, the performance on the y-axis. So a higher is better. This um, metric is called area under the curve. Um, it goes between 0.5 and 1. 1 is the best, 0.5 is the worst. And um, what these different colors correspond to is adding additional information. So these different neural network architectures can, uh, are, can easily accommodate additional information per particle. And the, the upshot of the more information you add, the better they are. Um, and there are some interesting physics constraints you can impose to make these um, neural networks more robust and um, um, uh, interpretable. In fact, this totally crazy picture I'm showing here it corresponds to the um, structure of the latent space for a particular configuration uh, in which the size of these crazy looking filters actually can be predicted from QCD uh, amazingly. Okay, um, there are also advantages to say deep sets over other methods in the context of say RNNs, which are also variable length. Um, uh, in, in that they're faster to train, so this can actually um, reduce the, the reduce the um, R and D cycle and therefore um, increase performance. So here's a nice picture that shows um, the performance of flavor tagging in Atlas as a function of the jet energy, and higher is better. Um, the purple and green have basically the same. This is an RNN versus a deep sets approach, but because it's so much faster, the deep sets approach is it was a, they were able to optimize and, and therefore um, increase the performance quite a bit. All right, um, there are other approaches. In, so um, deep sets acts on point clouds and doesn't know about geometry. Um, but you can, uh, you can uh, use information about the distances between inputs, um, for instance, as a graph, um, to apply a graph neural network, which is sort of like a convolutional neural network, except that it's not a fixed grid. So you can imagine having any adjacency matrix where you can have um, your nodes connected with edges, and then you can have the edges be um, connect any any of the nodes together and apply what's basically a convolution operator um, to the graph. And um, uh, yeah, this uh, also um, works very well. And um, 
uh, has competitive, basically state-of-the-art performance in a number of tasks. Um, here, um, here's the in the context of um, tagging the uh, presence of a, a, a highly uh, Lorentz boosted top quark um, versus genetic quark and gluon jets. Okay, um, so that's my whirlwind tour of representations. And then the other task that's involved with constructing a neural network uh, and training it, um, or the machine learning algorithm, is, is how to how to supervise it. Um, so most machine learning algorithms that you've probably heard about are supervised. So you have examples, they like pictures of cats and dogs, and I know which pictures are cats, which pictures are dogs. I train my, say, convolutional neural network to distinguish the pictures, and that's um, how it works. Um, and that's also true in high-energy physics. So we have simulations, say, of signal in the background, you're trying to classify or distinguish a signal from the background. But there are a number of alternatives that use um, uh, less information. Um, unsupervised machine learning uses no uh, label information whatsoever. And I'll give you some examples of all these in just a second. Okay. So yeah, most of the machine learning that we do is supervised. So we have labeled examples. This is an advantage of having simulations. In simulation, you know what signal, you know its background, so you can just train a classifier to distinguish them. Um, there's some subtleties about how to do that training um, in the context of a loss function, which I'll say a bit more about in a second. Okay, so unsupervised is the other extreme. You have no labels. And typically the goal of these methods is to learn implicitly or explicitly the density of the data, P of X. Um, so just to give you an example, one strategy is called an autoencoder. And it takes some, some data, for instance, like an image. This is like a pixelated image on the left-hand side. It learns an encoder and a decoder, so two, two neural networks. And they're trained such that when you encode and decode, you're very close to what you started with. Um, so this is the context in which is unsupervised. I don't know if it's signal or background. I just know, is it close to what I started with? And um, clearly, if this um, uh, encoder decoder structure is doing its job properly, then it should assign more capacity to more common examples. and less capacity to less common examples. And so implicitly, it's learning something like the density um, uh, uh, when there's a bottleneck here. So it can't just learn the identity. OK. Then there's weakly supervised learning. And here you have labels for every example, but they're noisy. Uh, and so typically, uh, the context of these is that you have, say, two data sets, um, which are each mixed samples of your two classes. So I have some one data set that's some signal, some background, the other that's also some signal, some background with different ratio. And so I can assign a noisy label of, of signal to the signal enriched sample and a noisy label of background to the signal depleted sample. And then I can proceed with you know, machine learning in that way. And there uh, actually turns out you can do a lot of um, really optimal um, learning in, in this noisy context. And the last is semi-supervised where you have some partial labels. So typically these methods use some signal simulations, as well as some, say, like control region data where you don't have labels. Um, but it's probably mostly background or a single single process. And so you might imagine training, say, um, a classifier to distinguish some concoction of signal models against some control region, um, mostly background data, uh, in order to, to attain some sort of model agnostic sensitivity to a bunch of different signals. OK, um, there are some cautionary tales that are involved in this, which I'll um, very briefly say as an aside. So um, when we train these classifiers, often it's not good enough just to train them um, uh, in an uncontrolled way. Um, so um, for instance, let's say you're doing like a bump hunt, where you have a number of features that you can use for classification, and then one you're going to do a bump hunt with. So on the left-hand side, you might have like some steeply falling background for you know the normal case. And you train a classifier using a bunch of other features you apply a cut, and ideally you make the cut and it's still steeply falling. Um, but in reality, what happens is that the classifier is smart. It can learn about correlations between the feature you, you're, you're, you're bump hunting on and your other features, and it can sculpt bumps. So the, the you know, background only case can still make bumps. So there are a number of strategies to do to get around this, um, basically to train classifiers that are independent of the resonant feature. Um, and um, the way that people usually do this is that, um, you, you modify your loss function. So you have like a typical loss function um, where um, uh, you have, um, say, a penalty for having your signal close to you know, predicting, say, one, and your background close to predicting, say, zero. And then we add an additional penalty term that tries to ensure that the classifier can't learn the resonant feature indirectly. Um, and there are a number of possibilities for this decorrelation term. And this lambda here, you can think of like a Lagrange multiplier. So, it's sort of like a trade-off between how, how much you care about classification performance and how much you care about this decorrelation. The number of proposals, uh, I'm just going to like go through them super quickly. One is, it, is to have this um, 
basically train another neural network simultaneously that tries to predict the resonant feature from the classifier. If it can't, then you're doing a good job of decorrelating. Um, the other is to essentially impose just the correlation, compute the correlation between the, um, the classifier output and the resonant feature. And if their correlation is small, that's good. Um, people tend to not use the actual correlation because it's, you know, it only captures linear dependencies. And so there's this notion of distance correlation that generalizes the normal correlation they are used to, um, where um, uh, basically it's zero if and only if they're actually independent. Um, otherwise, it has some non non zero value. Um, and then you could try to impose um, uh, explicitly that the that the the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the neural network output, is the same across different values of the resonant feature. Um, this is, so these are three possible examples, and they have pros and cons. So adversaries are great because you want a second neural network. It's very flexible, can easily be multidimensional, but it, you know, it's just another neural network, so it has lots of parameters and it's hard to train. Um, distance correlation, it's convex, so easier to train. It's just a single quantity that you can just compute as a formula, um, so no free parameters, um, but it can be um, computationally challenging. And this last one readily generalizes to going beyond independence. Um, it also has no free parameters, but um, it requires um, typically some binning, um, so some discretization effects. Okay, here just showing how this works in practice. The left hand side is the usual, usual, this is actually signal versus background. Um, so there's like this is like boosted W boson tagging where background is steeply falling, signal is peaked around 80 GeV, W boson mass. And the right hand side is you train a bunch of classifiers, background only. So if you just train a classifier naively using a bunch of features of the jets and you make a cut, you get the black histogram. So it looks just like the signal, but there's no signal. That's bad. Can't fit, can't fit a bump on top of a bump. And the other lines here all correspond to various versions of decorrelation, and they all work to varying degrees. Um, and you can see they're all fittable after applying a cut on their classifier. OK, um, the other thing I'll quickly say is about prior dependence. So sometimes we need uh, a model um, that does not depend on the training sample property. So the example I like to say is if you have, let's say, uh, um, a particle of a given energy um, hits our detector and reg registers some measurements, you want to, let's say, predict the true energy given the measurements. And we want, uh, let, it's typically the case that we, we train this regression model, with like a uniform distribution of energies. Um, but in practice, often the data are like power law, steeply falling. And so we want it to still be true, be accurate in that case. Um, and so, you know, if your instinct was to train a classifier regression model to predict the true energy from the measured energies, um, that's what most people think about doing. And um, I claim that it's biased um, in the sense that it's prior dependent. And I'll just quickly say how that why that's the case. So suppose you have, you know, some measured features, some true features, um, x and y, and the typical thing to do is to train a neural network, um, f and g are neural networks, um, to predict the true given the measured. And if you do this, then um, uh, you can show that um, asymptotically your regression model will predict the average value of the true energy given the measured energy. And that can be a problem. These are just sorry. These are the most equations I'm going to show in the whole talk. The first one is just the definition of the average value. And the second line, I'm just plugging in the first line. And the point is that um, if you compute the average value of the, um, of the, of the calibrated energy, um, given the true energy, it's not necessarily the true energy. So ideally, the you know, calibrated energy of measured given true would be true. That means it's unbiased. Um, but it's not the case because there's some prior dependence. Um, here's just a simple example of how that works. So say you have measured and true. They're both Gaussians, simple, simplest possible case. Um, and um, you can imagine, so here, it's just like a linear regression problem. Um, so you can predict true as a function of measured, and then bins of true, if you plot the measured, you get a calibration curve that's not one to one. Um, and there are ways around this using machine learning, other alternative machine learning methods. So for instance, maximum likelihood estimation, which is the red, um, is prior independent and can be used as an alternative. Um, and there are other approaches that might work as well. Okay. So that was my Super Wolverine tour to this um, bottom right hand side of the of the uh, puzzle. And now I want to give a little bit of information about the other um, some other components. So now I'm going to go to fast simulation that is building um, uh, sur what are called surrogate models. So fast approximations to slow detector simulations and other simulations. OK, um, so the question is, can we train a neural network to emulate, say, a, a simulation? It could be a detector simulation or some other simulation. I'm going to use detector simulation as my example because um, detector simulations can be very slow, so they're in great need of acceleration. And just like the images I mentioned earlier, you can imagine a picture like this. It's a grayscale image where the pixel intensity would correspond to the energy deposited in a particular region. 
of the detector. Um, and uh, what is a generator in this context? A generator is nothing other than a map um, from random numbers to structure. Um, and so it's shown schematically here. And a deep generative model, say a neural network in this context, is nothing other than a case where this map is a neural network. Um, and so the map is deterministic. So if I'm going to have a stochastic generator, but the stochasticity comes from the random inputs, not the function itself. Um, there are four standard deep generative models that people are really excited about. General adversarial networks, normalizing flows, variation autoencoders, and then um, some combination of score based or diffusion models, which are the latest on the market. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna quickly explain how these all work. Um, for a GAN general adversarial network, it's constructed by training two neural networks. One that generates, you know, you know maps noise to structure, and the second neural network that distinguishes the um, generated examples from real examples, and they kind of compete. When the discriminator second neural network is confused, then the generator is doing a very good job, and you forget about the discriminator and just keep the generator. Variational autoencoders are a variation of the autoencoder I mentioned earlier. So you have a compression model and then a um, decompression model. Um, and the only difference in what I said earlier is that um, they're both uh, probabilistic. So, so that um, once you've trained this autoencoder, then um, you can um, use the decoder as a generative model. And lastly, there's normalizing flows. And um, normalizing flow, you start from some uh, latent space, you apply a series of invertible transformations. And at the end, you can just use the usual change of probability rule um, to get the density. So you have some initial density, usually it's like the Gaussian, and you map it through and you get some complicated density, and you can use maximum likelihood to train um, this function. Uh, and score-based models are sort of the latest in the game, and uh, they learn instead of the density, they learn the log of the density, uh, they learn the, the gradient of the density, which is called the score. And there are a number of reasons why learning the score can be um, uh, uh, superior to learning the density itself. And one way of training these is with the diffusion model where you basically smear the data until it matches the Gaussian and you can solve the stochastic differential equation um, to invert it. Okay, and as I say, these, all these models have been used for calorimeter simulation or slow detector simulation in general. Um, you can see here, this is the context of calorimeter simulation, which is often the slowest part of a simulation stack. There's GANs, VAEs, normalizing flows, and diffusion models, and they all seem to work very well and can scale to very high dimensions. Um, uh, and here is just, yeah, this is this, um, the field histograms in the top left show one example. This is just the guts of one of these neural networks that generates a multi layer color emitter um, using a generative adversarial network. This is just the, the picture of the generator where you input the particle energy, so it's conditional energy, and some, some random noise um, pass through a, a series of uh, blocks that are like convolutional neural networks, and then they are output three, say, three images, one for each layer. Um, there are a lot of uh, interesting features that you can use these uh, neural networks for. So um, because uh, you, you fix, say, like the, um, uh, they're like deterministic functions, you can imagine varying the inputs and seeing how that varies the outputs. So in, in this um, top picture here, um, uh, we're scanning the energy. So you fix the noise and just change the energy. And you can see without changing, basically we're fixing all the, random numbers, so all the Monte Carlo statistical uncertainty, if you like, you can see how an image would change if you change its energy. And more or less what happens is the shower gets deeper and there's more energy deposited. And the bottom picture showed what happens if instead of changing the energy, you change the location of the shower um, and the, you know, the, blob will move, the blob moves from the top to the bottom in the various pictures. Okay, um, I'm pretty excited to say that actually this is not just uh, something that's been studied in principle and practice, it's starting to be used. Um, here's a schematic diagram of the ATLAS uh, experiment detector simulation. Um, you can see different subsystems on the top, different particles on the, right, on the left and the middle are what's being used. And for intermediate energy pylons in the calorimeter, actually a, a GAN is being used um, to generate something like a billion um, showers in the next um, uh, round of simulations. Um, here's just show that it works pretty well. This is the average energy as a function of the pseudo rapidity. Um, and yeah, the, the GAN, um, uh, uh, reproduces j 4 um, pretty well, and it improves the performance in a number of areas. So the top left is the number of constituents inside jets, and the bottom right is the mass of jets. And the point is that uh, AF3 is the new one. It uses this scan as part of its um, uh, simulation compared to the old one in blue, and the, the red is closer to the black than is the blue, which is great. Uh, it's also fast. So 
is just to say that a value in neural network is independent of, of the energy, um, so it should be flat, whereas Jan4 scales, with, you know, it takes longer the higher the energy it is. Okay, um, one small caveat about all this is that um, uh, we have to be careful about um, uh, oversampling. So if you train on n events and you want to sample m much bigger than n events, do we have the statistical power of m or n? And it turns out that actually um, you, you can have a statistical power which is more than n, which is great. And it comes from inductive bias. It comes from the fact that um, we impose information, um, if nothing else, from the fact that you know physics simulate physics um, densities tend to be smooth as our neural networks. Um, and this is just a, a picture that shows how this works out in practice that um, uh, uh, um, basically, a sample that's been trained with a GAN um, can can actually um, uh, be better than what you might expect from just the starting sample size. You can oversample and, and actually achieve statistical amplification. All right. Um, so in the last part of my talk, I'm going to try to say something about um, parameter estimation um, and unfolding. So the inverse direction. And this is a huge subject, and I'm basically not going to touch parameter estimation at all. I'm only going to talk about unfolding, which is a, a sort of inference task where we're trying to invert uh, one of the you know, uh, inference tasks. We're trying to invert um, simulations. Okay, so the unfolding problem is that we um, measure some detector signatures, um, and we want to remove detector distortions and infer what the particles look like before they were distorted by our detectors. Um, so this is called unfolding, and um, what you might think about doing is if I could write down the likelihood, the probability of measured given true, I would say, well, my unfolded result is the true that maximizes the likelihood. Um, and that would be great, but the problem is that we want to measure high dimensional feature spaces. So measured is some hyperspectral data and the true are, you know, so also quite, quite complicated, high dimensional. And so we can't write down the likelihood P of measured given true. But uh, we have simulators, so we can sample from P of measured given true. And this gives rise to a type of machine learning called simulation-based or likelihood-free inference. OK, so I'll briefly show you one example, uh, just to give you a sense of how this works. Um, this is based on uh, reweighting. So reweighting is super common in high-energy physics. I have you know, data set 1 sampled from P, data set 2 sampled from Q. I'd like to learn weights that morph data set um, 1 in, into data set 2. And so the ideal weights would be Q over P. Um, but the problem is that I don't know P, I don't know Q. And the way we get around this is that we use neural networks. So neural networks trained as classifiers are actually very efficient likelihood ratio estimation. So you train a classifier to distinguish samples from P and samples from Q, and you can interpret the output, the neural network uh, score, as um, a likelihood ratio. And it turns out this changes the problem of density estimation, that is estimating P and Q separately, which is hard, into the problem of estimating the ratio directly, which is easier. OK. Um, and so yeah, this is um, very effective. We can learn likelihood ratios. Um, it's relatively simple to integrate complex um, data structures like symmetries of our data, um, variable number of, of particles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's complicated when you want to do it parameterized with a large number of parameters. This is just to say that it works. So here is an example where you have some E plus E minus uh, collisions, not unlike the ones that were talked about in the previous uh, talk, and reweighting the full phase space. So you reweight you know, all the particles, all their four vectors, all their flavors um, from one data set to another. Um, and it works very effectively. It's hard to visualize what that looks like. So here are just some one-dimensional projections. Uh, it doesn't matter so much what the features are, um, but the the blue is morphed into the um, into the black via the orange. And this is a very technical slide, but just to say that it works really well across the full phase space, even if you make very small changes or um, very delocalized changes. So for instance, like changing the fragmentation, the hadronization um, in Pythia or changing like how often you get strange particles. And these methods work exceedingly well. Um, you can also parameterize the reweighting. Um, we can learn a classifier that sort of interpolates between different parameter values, in this case, the strong coupling constant. And this plot is to show that it, this works and it's very, very effective. Um, and you can also use these models to do inference. So I, I, I promised I wouldn't talk much about parameter estimation, but you can indeed use them for parameter estimation. Um, and basically, so just say, um, you can use these reweighting functions as, as surrogate models. And um, I'm going to skip um, this, um, this slide. It basically just says how you can use these neural networks to do gradient descent, um, which is pretty great. You can imagine um, starting somewhere and then using this high dimensional neural network um, to take gradients and, and actually try to find the optimal values. All right, so the very last thing I'm going to talk about is this unfolding business. 
where uh, the usual approach is that we we project down our face space into some low dimensional summary statistic, and then we make bins and a histogram, and then we go from the bottom left to the bottom right. And um, we do this with you know basically taking a matrix and inverting it. We know um, for each bin of the measured, of the true, how it gives rise to a measured, we can invert that um, using various forms of regularized matrix inversion. But one possibility could be to optimize the detector level observables using neural networks. Here's a plot that shows that, that works um, pretty well. This is in the context of DIS, um, so not the LHC, but um, similar idea, where uh, these are traditional methods for reconstructing, um, say, um, the, the collision X. Um, and the right-hand side shows a neural network that sort of basically gets the best of both worlds. It interpolates very well. And the point is that for doing differential cross-section measurements, the particle level observable better be physically defined because you want to make calculations. But the detector level observable can be whatever you want it to be. And so you can design it to be tailored to match um, as good as possible given your detector. Um, an alternative strategy is to instead of tailoring your observable, is just unfold everything. Um, and this would be impossible to do without machine learning, but now is um, possible um, with different approaches. Uh, and basically, machine learning allows us to do unfolding unbind in high dimensions. And there are a number of proposals that for this. Uh, here are two compared. One is called Omnifold, which is based on reweighting, and one that's called CINN, which is based on neural normalizing flows. And they both work pretty well. And what's really what's shown here is that you can measure two dimensional phase space, um, uh, and then you can easily get a cross section measurement of their ratio, which is impossible if you do this with bins, because um, you have all sorts of discretization effects that just don't apply if you do this on bin. All right, so I cover a lot of ground in very little time. I try to give you um, a sense of uh, the breadth and depth of uh, machine learning for energy physics, giving some specific examples. And I hope I've made it clear that these tools have great potential um, to uh, um, further the science of energy physics across frontiers. There are applications now that were basically unthinkable before the deep learning revolution, and new ideas are still coming in very fast. Um, and we need everyone's help in order to um, develop and deploy these methods. Um, and I've given some specific examples today, but if you want to hear, see a, exclusive, uh, see a comprehensive list of applications, there's a living review that continuously grows with time. And with that, I will, I will end. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now open for some questions. Yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, now since machine learning techniques started becoming more com uh, better than the conventional techniques, I was just wondering, uh, are, they, are there efforts for applying them to legacy data, say from LIP or the Tevatron? So maybe there are uh, signals that we've missed or maybe more information that can be gleaned? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would say absolutely. Um, I'm personally involved in actually those, some of those efforts. Um, and uh, so, for example, the the example I gave here, I didn't explain it at all, but it's it's DIS, and and actually this is this example is from is from Hera, so we're you know we're reanalyzing Hera data um, uh, using the latest and greatest, in, in fact, this machine learning method, um, and um, I'm personally interested, and I know there are others who are interested in in um, using both measurement, new measurement, and search strategies to extract more information from from those old um, data sets. Um, and it's amazing, given the new insights that we have, how much we can still extract from these um, pristine data sets um, from before. OK. So my question is also related with that. And while doing the unfolding, how do you handle the covariance matrix? I mean, the systematics. How do you handle it? Right. So maybe I'll give the answer in the context of unbind unfolding. So. Um, uh, I mean, here there's nothing. There's nothing uh, special about doing it with a neural network. Um, so all the usual things still apply. Um, all the um, the usual um, setup is that you, know, you have a detector simulation that's accurate with the uncertainties, and so typically you vary the uncertainties to to see how that would affect the result. So you do the same thing here. It just requires some more computation than usual because it often requires training, you know, one or many uh, neural networks. Um, the complication arises when you want to know, say, method non-closure. Um, uncertainties because it's harder to probe, you know, um, uh, in a high-dimensional space, like where where your biases are. 
Um, for standard experimental uncertainty, there's no problem. It's just the usual. You vary some aspect of the detector simulation and you, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, but uh, um, getting like model biases is a bit trickier, but still there are, there are techniques that can be used um, to do that. Uh, hi, Ben. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I also wanted to follow up on this aspect. So since there's anyway uh, in the field, a lot of discussion about how uncertainties will be handled with neural networks. So uh, I wanted to get your take overall on if we are going to use things like, uh, uh, you know, generative models or things like that. And then uh, how do we study biases that come in? And uh, how do we uh, assign uncertainties because of that, which we have, uh, which we have some techniques of doing for traditional methods. Yeah, in many cases, the uh, traditional method, the methods that we had for classical approaches, they apply here also. Um, so there's nothing super special. Like, in a sense, what I like to say is, you know, um, if you compute the invariant mass of, you know, say like a jet, that's a very complicated high dimensional nonlinear function, just like a neural network. The only difference is that you know I can write down a formula and it somehow makes makes us feel safer, um, but it's still quite complicated. But approaches that we have for propagating uncertainties in the usual ways those also apply. But um, that said, um, of course, it's more difficult to validate the performance in high dimensions. So the generative models I talked about, the surrogate models, the fast simulations, there is uh, I would say an open research question how to best validate them. We have some ideas um, uh, of how to like project down to low dimensions or do other tasks that allow us to check the quality of the um, of the simulations. But um, figuring out how to do that in a holistic way um, probably will require, you know, application specific solutions, um, and it's still an active area of R and D. Um, but in general, um, uh, you know, uncertainty quantification is is definitely a, a well studied and thought through process for machine learning in general. And in many cases, um, uh, I think the real concern is whether you're being optimal, not so much whether you're being biased, because we have really good approaches for estimating uncertainties using um, you know, complicated methods, classical, complicated classical methods. And you know, typically now, you know, if you're, let's say your simulation is a bit wrong when you train your classifier for a given task, that usually means you're going to be suboptimal, but not necessarily that you're going to have a wrong answer. I go. Hi, it's a great talk. Uh, I just had a question, probably very unfair for you, but there's a lot of machine learning going on in collider operation and collider detector interface. So I wonder whether there's any crosstalk between those guys and you who is looking at data sets from the detectors and stuff. That, that would be good to know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if I just quickly go back to here, this picture, I, I said something about how machine learning can be used already you know, for experimental design or for like QA, QC, right? Um, or operations. And um, there is some crosstalk for sure. So one, I think fun area is in the area of anomaly detection. So anomaly detection can be used for finding new physics, but it can also be used for finding problems with detectors. And, you know, that's very similar techniques can be used for both of those cases. And in the latter case, it's you know something you know which will find a lot of anomalies and can be used online to help correct for them. Um, I'm personally interested in the context of um, experimental design, so using um, machine learning methods to the buzzword is co-design. So design a detector knowing how it will be used later, um, and um, uh, this is a, I think a very powerful tool that is not so useful for the LHC detectors because they already exist and aren't going to change that much in the future. But for future colliders or other experiments that are not at the LHC, or say some of the auxiliary experiments that are being proposed around the LHC complex, then these tools can be used for that case as well. So I see no further questions at the moment. So thank you very much, Benjamin. And with that, we pause for coffee. And we come back sharp at 11.50. So 